Back when I was a little kid in kindergarten, uh, they would tell us to lay down and go to sleep on one of these little mats. And I remember that real well. The thing was, I, I didn't want to go to sleep in the middle of the day. I, most people, most little kids don't. You, you know any little kids that like to go take a nap or go to sleep in the middle of the day? Now, when we get adults, that's a, that's a pleasure, right, to go take a nap. But uh, when you're a kid, it sure ain't. Uh, so because I was told to do it, everything in me didn't want to do it, right? C can y'all relate to me here? Uh, now, I, if I was actually tired as a kid, though, no one needed to go find a mat. No one needed to lie, lie for, tell me to lie down. I'd go just lay down somewhere and go sleep, right? Because I, I was tired. I wanted the rest, right? Now, I've noticed that the same thing can be said in our spiritual lives. Now, follow me here. If we make the law of God into a do this, this is the rule, you go do it type of thing, well, our hearts just tend to rise up in rebellion. You're not going to tell me, you know. It's much easier for someone who sees the heaviness of life, the, the need for rest, the, the need to listen, the, the, the one that sees that, it's much easier for them to come to Jesus. Wouldn't y'all agree? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And this is the kind of thing that we're going to be looking at tonight in the book of Matthew. We're going to be dealing with the Sabbath law of rest and what that actually meant. And uh, some of the religious leaders of Jesus' day had actually taken the day of rest and made it into a day of work, a day of a burden, right? Imagine that, taking the day that God gives you to rest and turning it into something you got to worry over. Something you got to be frustrated over. Something you got to be all careful about. Uh, to the almost uh, schizophrenic type of attitude about it. So, in Matthew 11, verse 28, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. For your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here he says, come to me. But what is it they come in away from? What are they going away from? They're coming away from, what the text tells us, is a heavy yoke. Something, a heavy burden. You see, people in Jesus' day would have easily known what a yoke was and understood it in this context. A yoke uh, isn't something in the egg uh, or anything like that. A yoke was placed on the neck of an ox or another animal to go till the land, to go do something. That ox or other animal would pull the, the till or it'd be hitched to a wagon and it would pull a load, right? And sometimes it would pull a heavy load and sometimes it would pull a light load. And the religious leaders of Jesus' day which were called the Pharisees, they had put a heavy burden on people who were wanting to come to God. Now imagine this. I, I put this heavy yoke on the old ox over here and I hold out a carrot for him, right? Now it's so heavy, he can't pull. He can't move because of all the burden he has. Well, Jesus says, my yoke is easy. You can come right on. You can come right to me. But they had made things difficult. They had actually added things to the Bible, thinking they were keeping people away from sin. But what they ended up doing was keeping people away from God. And this is very important to see. Because what we call the Old Testament, which is the holy words of God, written before uh, Jesus walked the earth, uh, the religious leaders had added texts to that that were supposed to explain uh, the Old Testament. 
which they called uh, the Talmud. The Talmud. Uh, the Old Testament, they didn't call it back, back, back then. They called it the Tanakh. And, and the, the Talmud, which was added to the Tanakh, the Old Testament, it added hundreds of different specific laws onto the Word of God. I've used this example before. If you were to spit on the Sabbath and the wind get the dirt where your spittle had been and made a mud ball, you worked on the Sabbath, you had sinned. I mean, that, that, that's some of the, the ideas that you'll see within this, this Talmud, this, this uh, uh, gathering together that the rabbis had, trying to explain the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Now, why, why did they do this? If you have read the Tanakh or the Old Testament to us, you know that it includes the history of the Jewish people, right? And uh, you know that it includes that history, and it shows how they failed miserably to do what God had told them to do. God gave them the Ten Commandments. We'll follow it. They didn't, right? Matter of fact, they, they cast God aside the first chance they got. They got a king. They said, I want a king. We don't want God ruling us. They, they, they just, every man did what was right in his own eyes, it tells us in the book of Judges. I mean, it's just this constant failure to do what God wants them to do, right? And God had promised them, though, that if they went off and they served other gods and they went after other things, then God promised them that he would allow them to be conquered by a foreign land and taken off into captivity. And this promise is clear in the Old Testament. And you know what happens, don't you? At a point in the Old Testament, you see they get carried off. Why? Because they wouldn't do what God told them to do. They failed to follow. And the Babylonians conquered them and hauled them off to Babylon, to a foreign land. And you can read all about that in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, the book of Jeremiah, and all these different places. And they miraculously returned, even you can see that in the Old Testament, after 70 years. And by the time of Christ, they were here in Israel, and they were being ruled over still by a foreign land. They were ruled over by the Romans. So the Jews had mourned over their failure after this time. When they came back from, from Babylon, when they were able to come back after 70 years, they mourned over it, that they had not kept God's law. And in fear of breaking these laws given to them again, they added to the law to make certain they wouldn't break the law that was. They'd add these other things on to keep them from breaking it. But what they had done was add this heavy yoke of burden on the people. And that's what Jesus was calling out here. See, the problem with that idea is that adding to the law actually breaks the law. Right? God says many times throughout His Word, do not add to nor take away from my Word. It's at the beginning. It's at the middle. It's at the end. There's a couple of little stops in between. He, he repeatedly says this. And the, the Jews, desiring to be holy, didn't, but became legalistic. They became rule followers instead of relationship havers with God. Jesus was giving the invitation for them to come out of legalism and into a real relationship with Him. That's what they needed. That's what, they, even if they didn't know it, that's what they desired. Because that yoke was so heavy upon them of all this legalism. See, following God isn't just following rules. This is what the world believes. This is why they don't want to take part in worship. They believe it's about God keeping them from something. When God is giving them something, right? Right? When it talks about salvation, it doesn't talk about a heavy burden. It talks about a gift that's given to you, that you receive, right? Not something you do, not something you earn, but a gift. And man, if the world could just see that, what a difference it would make. So unfortunately, the Jews in Jesus' day, and, and for many today, they have these 
extensive, ridiculous laws that supersede the laws that God had given. Their traditions have become more important than the Word of God. And let me tell you, tradition can be a hard taskmaster. It's so sad. It's so very sad. But I've seen people fight with more uh, passion for a tradition than they ever fought for the truth of the Word of God. Y'all probably have too, ain't you? It's sad. It's sad because tradition's going nowhere. Tradition is good. There's nothing wrong with tradition. It keeps us in mind. It keeps us in focus if it's used rightly. But when tradition goes over top of the Word of God, we're in a bad, bad place. When ritual becomes more righteous than the written Word of God, we're in a bad, bad place. And that's what we see here. And the thing he was offering them was putting away, setting, setting the tradition in its place, putting the ritual in its place, and having the Word of God in its place and that relationship with Christ. So, what's interesting about this is in the next passage, Jesus is going to be scolded by the Pharisees for breaking, ironically, their traditions on rest. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. All right, let's unpack this a little bit. So the Sabbath observance was really the heart of the Jewish legalistic system. And uh, when Jesus violated the traditions as to how they perceived that day should be honored, he struck a nerve. In much the same way, I, I've, as I was talking about, I've seen people get disturbed when talking about making a change in the church they don't like. There was once a pastor who was told that uh, many of his congregation were getting sick from flowers that were laid out at Easter. It was a, a, an allergy to these flowers, tons of them were. And these flowers were a tradition of the church. But they caused many in the congregation to suffer from headache and allergies after attending the service during that month of Easter. And the pastor asked the lady in charge of the flowers to place them outside the sanctuary. And she agreed to do it. But on Easter morning, the flowers had to be there. And the pastor came in early and saw that all the flowers had been placed back in the sanctuary. And when he asked the lady about it, she said, let them take Benadryl. <laughs> let them take Benadryl. She was more concerned about the tradition of the flowers than the health of the people attending the church. See the danger of tradition? It causes you not to care about what God cares about. Who did God send His Son to die for? Why, the lilies of Easter. No, He didn't. He sent His Son to die for the people. The people. He did it for them. So this, this concern over the flowers most certainly could be compared to the legalistic concern of the Pharisees about the Sabbath. Both that English Sabbath and the Greek Sabbaton transliterate Shabbat which has the basic meaning of ceasing, rest, inactivity. At the end of creation, 
God, it says in Genesis 2, 3, said He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it He rested from all His work which He had created and made. And in honor of that day, the Lord declared it to be a, a special time of rest and remembrance for His people and incorporated its deservance into the requirements of the Ten Commandments that He had given. Now, I'm not going to get sidetracked tonight and discuss whether we should keep the Sabbath today and all of that. I, I'll just say this. Uh, we Christians worship on Sunday because that is the day of the week when Jesus rose. And that made it the greatest day in all the week, right? On Sunday. Uh, and uh, thus we have a day to rest from our labors and worship our God. And I'm thankful for it, aren't you? I am. But tonight, this lesson really isn't a commentary on whether or not we should keep a rest or a worship day and all that. Because we're going to find here the disciples did nothing against the law. Even back during the Old Testament times, they didn't break the law at all here. Jesus called them guiltless, and there was a reason. See, on this particular Sabbath, as they were walking along those grain fields, His disciples began to pluck those heads of grain to eat them. And the law permitted them to help themselves to grain from their neighbor's field. Did you know that? As long as they didn't use a sickle, according to Deuteronomy 23:25. 25. This is what it says. When you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. Well, that's as clear as the nose on your face, isn't it? Right? It's probably why Jesus looked at him and said, Have you not read? Sometimes we think we know the Bible and we ain't read it, right? So, so this didn't go against God's word at all, what they had done. And the Pharisees, though, they were literally famous for being legal nitpickers. You ever met one? A nitpicker that they can find just that little, little, little thing wrong with you. They've got a giant stick hanging out their eye, but they can find that little tiny speck in yours, right? They've heard a parable about that before. And that, that's what they were like. See, <clears throat> though their specific charges against them aren't really stated here, it's likely they were probably making a bigger deal out of it and accused the disciples of harvesting the grain. Now, the Talmud, their extra book of tradition, it said this, if a person rolls wheat to remove the husk, it is sifting. If he rubs the heads of wheat, it is threshing. If he cleans off the side adherences, it is sifting. If he bruises the ears, it is grinding. And if he throws it up in his hand, it is winnowing. My goodness, you better not move on the Sabbath, my friend. You might as well tie yourself to the bed and not get up, right? But within their Talmud... They had taken away from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament. Jesus, I mean, this is sarcasm. Jesus uses sarcasm. Do you realize that? He looks at these people who had memorized entire books of the Bible. I, I know some of us may have had a few verses, right? These folks, they memorized entire books and could quote them verbatim back to you in Hebrew. All right? They did that. He looks at them and he says, Have you not read? You understand how hurtful that would be to somebody who memorized whole books of the Bible? Of course I've read. I've read the whole thing. I memorized five, the first five books. Have you not read what David did, he says? He says to them, Do you really know what the Scripture says? You know, we can read Scripture, can't we? I can read this to you tonight, but to know it, it's something the Holy Spirit opens up, isn't it? To know it. And once David was in exile, he and his men had went to the wilderness and they ate the show bread. This was the ritualistic bread that was set off to the side. It, it was uh, there within the temple. Twelve memorial loaves that were forbidden as food to anybody to eat but the priest. And uh, neither David nor his men nor the, the priest were ever found with fault for eating this showbread when they were starving to death when they come to the, the temple. And the reason is that God's law was never intended to inflict hardship on His faithful people. See, on that particular occasion, an exception was made by the priests on behalf of David and his men who were weak from hunger. And why were they weak from hunger? Israel was out trying to attack them. The king Saul was trying to kill them. And so all of these things were against David. And the priest made an exception to allow him to eat this bread. 
And um, God was not offended by that act. He did not discipline David nor one of them. Uh, the Lord was willing for a ceremonial regulation to be violated when doing so was necessary to meet the needs of His beloved people. It makes, if God makes allowances for His own law to be broken under certain circumstances for the welfare of the people, Jesus said, He surely permits purposeless and foolish man-made traditions to be broken for that purpose. The Lord didn't reprove His disciples at all because they hadn't done anything wrong. And then he makes another point. He looks at them and he says, You guys know that the priests work every day on the Sabbath, yet no one tears them down. They're in there working in the temple, doing all these things, killing, sacrificing the animals. Yet they are blameless because they are engaged in the service of God. So when you're doing something good on the Sabbath, it's not a bad thing, right? If it's the day of rest, but you're doing something good, it's not bad. See, the issue is the Pharisees had never understood the heart of God. Jesus quoted to them there, Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Boy, it'd be a good to memorize, wouldn't it? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. God puts compassion before ritual. God is good. God is good. He would rather see His people picking grain on the Sabbath to satisfy their hunger than observing the day so strictly as to inflict a physical distress on them. If the Pharisees had only realized that, they wouldn't have condemned the disciples. It wasn't anything they had done that was rightfully to be condemned, but they would have valued, uh, they valued instead outward piety above human welfare. And then the Lord looks at me and says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus was the one who instituted the law in the first place. And therefore, He was that one most qualified to interpret what its meaning was, right? Does Jesus not make clear what the Old Testament says? Is He not the answer to everything in the Old Testament? Isn't He the fulfillment of everything there? He said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it, right? And so He did. But they couldn't see that. They couldn't see that because they didn't know God. They didn't know God. Finally this. If they come after the disciples, <clears throat> they're also going to come after the Lord. Look here at verse 9. Verse 9. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him saying, listen to this. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they might accuse him. Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Or how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched that out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. And they say, is it against the law of God to heal somebody on the Sabbath? Well, let's see here. If you had to miss church on Sunday to go feed a family in need, would that be against the Bible? If you didn't have time to have your morning devotions because you had to rush out the door to save someone in a house fire, would you have broken God's law? If you had to skip the Lord's Supper service one Sunday to prepare food for the hungry, would you be in violation of the Bible which tells us not to forsake the gathering together of ourselves? No. No. Because you've got to know the heart of God. There's rules, there's laws, and there's reasons. But also, you've got to know the heart of God. You see, we must be able to hear His heart within the words of God. And we must be able to let the Holy Spirit guide us. Now, would it be wrong to skip out on church each Sunday uh, while finding some other ministry up? Well, we're, we're going doing this, this, and we're going doing this, uh, this, uh, right? And it's really not about helping those people. It's just not coming to church. <laughs> well, that would be wrong. 
Let's get real here. This is what we want to do. We want checklists. We want uh, to be able to say, I, I did so much and that's all. I how, how far do I have to go instead of uh, how close can I get to God? Right? That, that's the idea. How close can we get to God should be our thought. Not, not how close do I have to get. Right? Right? Yeah. Of course. Of course. But they couldn't see that. They had grown in this, this religion that was so destructive and such a yoke on their neck. All they knew was just that legalism. That legalism. Tearing them up. God knows your heart. I think you know it too. God knows your heart. And you know it too. Don't be foolish. You know. You know what your relationship is with God. And Jesus points out these Pharisees' hearts. They certainly would have saved a sheep in order not to lose out on money on the Sabbath. They've been the first ones out there, right? Right? Because they had to sell those sheep. They, they would have taken care of that. Why? It wouldn't... But they didn't want to help somebody in need on the Sabbath. They didn't want to take care of a, of a human being. Why? Because it wouldn't... And help or hurt their bank account either way if he was healed on the Sabbath. God knows your heart. That should be a happy thing and a terrifying thing at the same time, right? God knows your heart. And we must remember that everyone is precious in God's sight. He finds human beings so precious, He sent His Son to die for their sins. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you knew the heart of God, this is a no-brainer. This is a no-brainer. Of course you're going to heal the man on the Sabbath if you can heal the man on the Sabbath. Jesus then calmly asked that man to stretch out His hand in order to reveal the healing that had already occurred. He'd already took care of it. For they had even answered the question. Then the Pharisees uh, revealed to us all their heart. How many of you think murder's wrong? Your heart tells you that for certain, doesn't it? Is murder wrong? Absolutely. What are they planning on doing? To destroy him. And he didn't talk about taking about his reputation or, or his social media following. We're not talking about a cancel culture issue here at all. We're talking about killing the man. They're plotting to kill the man, the man, the Son of God. That word there means to declare that one must be put to death or worse if possible. The worst possible death. They were plotting to do that to them, to him. Their hearts are clearly revealed, right? And if they had acknowledged that, just the common sense of it, they would have realized they need to run to God because they're in a bad place. But they don't. They don't. You see, the children of God look like Him. The children of God have His heart. You'll see it in them, won't you? You'll see it. Let's be wary of legalism and let's seek to have the heart of God. The heart of our Father, right? In all things. And that's where we should try to be. And folks, rest in that truth tonight.